movie <laughs> We're lying, makes Liam. people think. <laughs> It's like reverse, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, well, if you're just joining Thanks us, transparency. Uh, you, you got you got a bit of the uh, pre-show show. Uh, uh, my name's Adam Henko. I'm with the Makers Mob. This is the Samurai Carpenter. And then over on the far side, Liam Hoffman, uh, the, the blacksmith. Um, we're here hanging out. Say hi, guys. What's hi. up? There we go. That's them saying hi. Uh, if you guys can hear us all, make sure you guys let us know in the chat. Um, some of you might be on the Makers Mob YouTube. Some of you might be on the Samurai Carpenters YouTube. And then some of you might be on Liam Hoffman's YouTube channel. We're on uh, all no three channels on my right now. YouTube, probably. Ah, they might be. You never know, Liam. You never know. Um, so you know, Your channel's been blowing up, hasn't it? <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> YouTube, that's, that's your favorite platform from what I've heard. <laughs> well, it, you can rub him, uh, you can bug him about YouTube, but he can definitely rib you about Instagram. Oh yeah, he dominates. He dominates me on Instagram. I, that that that's like we're switched in that way. I'm looking me up on YouTube. Right I now. hate Instagram. I, like my Instagram channel like grows so slowly and does nothing, and then. And it's like the other way around for Liam. But. Yeah. No, mine mine <laughs> stopped growing. They, I, it's Instagram's fault though. It's, it's not my fault. It's I Instagram's haven't changed anything. Fault. The algorithm. It's <laughs> always the algorithm. <laughs> I blame the algorithm. Just like um, I would blame so, all my tools if nothing turns out right. Yeah. That's that's a good way of doing it, I guess. Um, we're gonna just do a couple. Um, announcements here for anyone who's part of the makers mob and if you want to get a little insight on what's going on inside the makers mob and then we're going to just chat with uh with these guys about what they've got going on with liam um we're going to be taking focusing more on the blacksmithing side of things for the q a if you got any questions uh pop them in the chat in a little bit don't put them in there yet because they'll probably get lost uh in the flow so uh just just to keep you up to date uh on some things going on inside the Makers Mob, uh, we have some announcements. I love this guy. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. It's like my go-to announcements. There's, there's no sound effect, though. It should have, like, the comp. <laughs> there you go. There we when go. Where did he get on Makers Mob? <laughs> <laughs> Coming soon to the Makers Mob, we have yeah. a new maker. <laughs> Ron Burgundy. Ron Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> the Makers um, Mob. But seriously, cool. coming soon to the Makers Mob is the Kamiko Challenge with Neil Pask from Pask Makes. Um, he is going to be teaching uh, a course that's going to be a twofold course. It's going to be starting with um, making the Kamiko panels themselves. Um, he's going to teach you how to make the jigs you need, how to prep the material, uh, how to put the panels together. And then we're going to include a project to kind of bring it all together. Um, at the end of the challenge, and that is uh, going to be in June. That we're going to start that. So the sign up for that is ending on June the 13th at midnight. So you have until then to sign up. There is a link in the description uh, to sign up for that. If you sign up for the Makers Mob, you and you're a member, you get access to that. So uh, whether you're signing up to get Liam's stuff um, or you sign up for any of the other things, you're going to get access. To that as well. Um, Liam also, if you didn't know, has full tutorials inside the Makers Mob for these beauties. Liam, can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so the axe making tutorial, that that was actually the only axe making tutorial that exists for me, I believe. I've got stuff here and there on YouTube, but it's, it's like bits and pieces of different parts of axe making or, or you know, if you pay attention really closely, maybe you can pick up stuff. But this is the only thing where it's uh, a complete, um, fully disclosed process on making the axes. Um, everything from forging the steel axe head and the tools that you need to forge it and different ways to forge it, depending on your setup, to the woodworking side of things, making the handle and putting it all together. So tons of info on all about axe making in there. It's pretty much like all inclusive axe tutorial. And yeah, and then and it's a bearded hatchet, which is like it's extra sexy. It's not just like you're making some <laughs> mediocre axe. It's like just for you, Jesse. It's, just it's, it's got that like kind of Viking European sexy slash North American classic Liam Hoffman style. It's just like throw all the countries in there. It's good. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that is in there as well as there's some other uh, tool making tutorials that Liam's got in there. This particular tutorial is like 20 parts. It's almost three hours. It's super in depth. Um, and you can do it as quickly or as slow as you want. There's also, we did actually some printouts of like, you can print out a couple pages and it's like a scaled printout for the actual, oh, yeah. to, to be able to get the, uh, the actual feel of what the size of the, the this is. So uh, that's in there as well. Um, we've also got a bunch of tutorials. You get access to that. So there's there's a link below in the description. You get, uh, you're gonna get a deal on all this stuff. Um, we got live replays for the members only lives that we do inside the Makers Mob. This one is open to the public. Um, next week, I'm actually going to be going live with Jimmy Duresta on his YouTube channel, the man. Uh, as well as the Makers Mob, the Godfather of Making on YouTube. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to be chatting next week, finding out what's uh, what's going on with him, and then we got uh, John Heise's putting out a small toolbox build that's going to have plans and everything available on the makers mob as well so i think that's it oh no one more thing uh prizes can, yes so this is what we're giving away this month there's a contest every month we do called the project of the month you have until uh june 1st at midnight uh to put in your prize for this last month and you can win these guys i'm going to announce the winner of this contest when i'm live with jimmy next thursday on his channel so um, if you remember, you can still get your projects in to win this. That is it for announcements. Uh, guys, what's going on? What's happening in your life? Who wants to start? Well, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still waiting on Liam to send me a replacement handle for, uh, <laughs> the one that I broke. <laughs> what? I don't remember this. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I said I broke the handle, and you're like, oh, we send out replacement handles. I was like, oh, that's great. You know, I, I did, look forward to getting one, and that was like, what, seven months ago or something like that. It's all right. I know you're busy. <laughs> well, just send us another email. <laughs> I didn't even know you didn't get a handle. <laughs> no, I, I busted it when I took it camping. I was getting all uh, ogre on some firewood, and... Uh, yeah, I, I broke the handle, being a little too ag aggressive with the axe. And then I think I made a post on Instagram, and they were like, people were like, oh, Liam, we'll send you a new one. And then you like kind of commented, you're like, oh, yeah, we'll send you out a new handle. And then I was like, oh, okay. And then, yeah, you know, it's all right. It's all right. I don't, I'm, I'm not that important in your life. So like, you invited me on here tonight <laughs> on camera live. <laughs> To put me under pressure to force my hand. Hold on. Oh, I send he's writing a memo. Jesse, he's writing a memo. All right, guys, Handle. that sums up this live. Thanks for joining us. I know I know Leah I know Liam loves it when people rib him and like I handle. Use lots of sarcasm because that's like his favorite thing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Liam, I'm going to single you out now. Tell us what's happening, uh, what's happening down where you are as far as your day to day and what you got uh, going on, but don't share too much. No, he's all about transparency. What do I, I don't even, there's like an incredible amount of things. Pick one. It's a revolving carousel in my head. The way my head works, it just want things. It's like, it's constantly spinning and then one pops up and I get about 10 minutes of that. And then the next one comes up and then I'm getting nothing done. So tell me, tell me like where you're at as far as like business now, because obviously like you started out in your tiny little shed, like on your parents' property. And then, you know, you went on fortune fire, you became a superstar and, <laughs> and everything has changed <laughs> since then. And last time I saw you, when you came up to visit me and do the, the um, salt spring Island course or whatever with Jerry and the, and all the other hooligans out there you you know i had, had bought the your shop space and you were like setting up your shop that you're in now and so like how, like where where's your business at as far as like how many employees do you have and like how, you know like what what is your kind of weekly s system for you know getting stuff done and and how is it all working out for you Hmm. Well, everything changes so fast around here right now. I think the last time I saw you was like that two years ago. Yeah, it's over two it years been, now. Yeah, it's the last time years. I saw you. Yeah, so I 
Um, I've just been buying tons of equipment. Um, we have, I, I, I just constantly upgrade things like my, I love blacksmithing, but another thing that I love is the process, like relentlessly changing the process and irritating everyone else in the shop at the same time. So I'll, you know, if, if I figure out we can save such amount of time on a step or something, uh, then I'll buy the machine for it. So our, our shop has been evolving like rapidly. We have so many new things now that we didn't have six months ago or a year ago, or especially two years ago. So, um, just been upgrading machinery. A lot of, a lo almost everything is all old machinery, like 1940s to 1980s. Mainly there's some stuff older than that and some stuff newer than that. But, um, I want to do everything in my own shop. I don't want to sub anything out. And in order to do that, you have to have uh, good processes and the space and the machinery and jigs and all that stuff. So I love um, coming up with the processes and then designing the jigs and the tooling. And then we make the tooling in house also. And then we test the tooling and the processes and all that stuff. And so axes are still our main primary thing. Um, we're years out on axes. <clears throat> And um, we want to be coming out with knives in the next year, maybe. They're going to be forged to finish integral knives. So I don't know if you know what an integral knife is, but it has a steel bolster that is the same stock as the blade. It's not two separate pieces. So the tang, the bolster, and the blade is all one solid piece of steel, which is a common method of doing a high-end knife not a production knife. So like a high-end knife, you'd see an integral knife and have an integral bolster and everything. And uh, I don't know of anyone that does that production, mainly because of the equipment and the processes that it would take to be able to do it in-house. And we have all that now. So I'm currently in the process of designing the dies and the process to make that. So it'll be uh, forged to finish. The bevels, the bolster, the tang, everything will be forged to finish. And then I'll just put the edge on it and it'll have a solid wood hidden tang handle with an heirloom fit. So it'll look like a $2,000 knife, but I'm hoping to be able to make it in the same price range as like a stock removal knife. So that's like a huge project I've got been in my head for a year and slowly making progress on. And um, I don't know, I'm probably just gonna get off on lots of tangents here. Uh, we just finished hooking up a massive dust collection system. It's a 30 horsepower dust collector that's ducted <laughs> all throughout the shop to Donaldson Torrit DEF T12 with a it's 12,500 CFM with a uh, 18 foot cyclone behind the shop and then the dust collector itself and that's plumbed into the wood shop and that is all in preparation for a brand new bocce T4 MO copy lathe that's coming from Italy right now and that will do the axe handles and so like my wood Another part of my business is the axe handles, just the handles. Yeah. And uh, do you ship replacement handles, Liam? Yeah, he stocks no. them too. Ask Jesse. Okay. No. <laughs> he doesn't Jesse ship them. He just stocks them. He just keeps tons and tons of piles of them in, in his shop. Yeah, it's <laughs> he only lets thirteen a week go out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the, the scarcity is not real. So. <laughs> I have, uh, we were offering handles, um, last fall and then, uh, sort of shut everything down on the handles in order to take on this project, the woodshop expansion project. And that is the lathe is supposed to arrive in like four weeks and then it'll be game time. And the, like, this is a brand new six figure copy lathe that's major. This thing will allow me to compete with big companies. Doing wholesale. So how orders. many how many does it does it do at a time? Because you already had a copy lathe. Yeah, that was, I've had I two saw copy that, lathes. I saw that work, and it does like five handles at a time or something. That was pretty cool. Yeah, the top one is a template, and then it does it cuts four just like it. This is the same setup, but it just has much newer technology on it to where it'll do it faster, more consistent, uh, less prep work on our end. 
it, it essentially does the same thing, but it'll save us a lot of labor. And uh, so we're going to be able to compete with like, I don't know if you guys have heard of any of these companies, but like House Handle or Beaver Tooth Handle. There's like a, a handful of uh, handle makers in the United States that sell like your typical hardware store quality yeah. handle, which is not quality. And yeah. so we'll be able to make really nice handles, but be able to compete with them wholesale wise because of this machine and this dust collection system and all that. So that has been a many multi month long, uh, process that is still not done yet, but that's going to be done soon. And, um, how many people do you have working for you right now? Just three, just three. Okay. Yeah. We're supposed to make three more hires this year. So when this lathe gets here, we're going to, be hiring three more and that's pretty sweet <laughs> he's awesome. like looking at that little shed that's like on, on their on your little axe <laughs> booklets or whatever and it's like going from that to where you're at now that's quite a quite a I, trend, steep transition. i know it's so weird so yeah i never I'll, would have thought that any of that would happen i'm i'm curious liam i mean you seem like a guy who is always working is this true are you yeah. like, you just like, you're working crazy hours nonstop all the time? I don't know about that crazy. I used to work way crazier. I I probably only work like only a hundred hours, hours a week. A week. <laughs> no, crazy. I probably only work like sixty five hours a week right now. Wow. I definitely used to for like a good four years work probably eighty plus. Wow. That was back when I was at the old shop, but wow. now I don't. He, he's either working, riding his bike, or he's out in the bush camping somewhere. Is that is that, is that pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, awesome. we've we've been it's doing a, a it's a beautiful a, simple life. Speaking about being out mm -hmm. in the bush, uh, Mr. Samurai Carpenter, we need to say congratulations on your official uh, dream coming true do you want to tell us do you want to tell a cryptic message about that <laughs> no yeah i'm well I've, I've announced it i announced it on the youtube channel for those of you guys who still still watch this old old dog um and uh you guys have seen me up fixing up this old barge to take materials out to my off-grid boat in access property that i i purchased so we just closed on that yesterday so it's like official i own five acres uh on a beautiful lake up island it's about two and a half hours uh up the uh, north from here and yeah i'm just trying to get uh, all the logistics figured out uh for how i'm going to be getting everything out there building docks and big like gang ramps to get up onto the um the property it's kind of got a little bit of a kind of stone bluff, not very big, but you know, I have to build a bunch of boardwalks and a ramp that goes to a floating dock where I can offload materials and there's just all sorts of logistical stuff. So my head is kind of in the same similar space of, of Liam's where I'm just kind of trying to like organize and like figure out how I can efficiently, you know, streamline building out there with no power and no road access. And, uh, and so it's like, you know, there's my, the wheels are turning kind of constantly as I'm just realizing that there's so, so much uh, logistical stuff to like figure out. But once I have like a dock built, like I, so I placed t a timber order for a, just a ton of yellow cedar to build a dock and I've got the floats and everything. And so I just have to transport my boat, um, my, my skiff barge, whatever, um, which is like, 27 feet long and nine feet wide up up island and it's kind of like a windy um road to get to the boat launch on the lake and uh so i'm gonna be just white knuckling it when that transport day comes because i'm gonna be taking the boat up and i'm gonna have like all the floats on the boat and like a big pile of wood too because i gotta want to just launch the boat and have like as much material on it already as possible because the trailer can handle a lot of weight. And so I was like, Oh, let's just load the whole thing up. So 
it's also kind of risky because if I do have a mishap on the road or some kind of accident, there's going to be just severe carnage. Uh, <laughs> Sounds so, like you need a helicopter. It, it, that would yeah. be nice, but I think they're like a hundred grand an hour or something like that. So no, I, buy one. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be cheaper than all this stuff you're talking about. Yeah. First project, build a helicopter pad. Yeah, so it's like the the hardest. I think like once the boat's in the water, I don't know if I'm ever going to take it out. I'll just like leave it at the property and and uh, use our other our other boat to kind of run zip back and forth. So. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be quite a, a thing. So I'm hoping to, in a video or two, um, do the big reveal where, you know, once we get the boat in the water, we'll get the drone going and you know, fly out there and show you show you the the glory because it is so beautiful, like like just jaw dropping, serene, majestic beauty. Just like i was, it's just I'm like. And still pinching myself like that I have this waterfront. The water is like so clean. You can see down like 30, 40 feet. And people, everybody just wow. drink, drinks the water right out of the lake. They just throw their, their pump lines right into the lake. You and, hit Giardia. I'm and, just going to die laughing. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, pretty sure, I'm, gonna, I'm pretty sure I'm going to filter it just to be safe. Oh, but, come on. Um, Everyone else does it. He yeah. just said it. I, I was drinking the... When I went out there in my canoe, I literally was just like dipping my Nalgene bottle and like drinking right out of the lake, and I didn't get sick. So, um, I just so, got a weird, I got a weird rash, but you know, <laughs> no. yeah, <laughs> some other de some other deformities. <laughs> Correlation is not causation. Don't know where that came from. So yeah, so yeah, I'm uh, pretty pretty stoked, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, I was hoping to you know have a nice relaxing summer, but I'm pretty sure it's just going to be a lot of just backbreaking labor and and all that fun stuff so so i'm assuming that you're going to use my axes to fell the trees on the land well i was definitely i was definitely i was definitely going to take your axe up you don't have a handle though it doesn't have a handle um <laughs> you know and be able to use it for you know clearing clearing brush <laughs> taking taking down some small Where's trees you know so uh you know, just just FedEx that out there, you know, 24 hour shipping. Just yeah. <laughs> same day, same day. Um, so we're going to get to some questions here. There's already a bunch of questions in the chat um, for, for Liam, a couple for Jesse. Um, uh, <laughs> this is, this is a good one. Why is Hoffman in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys are all in like nice. You guys look really relaxed. I'm like sweating. Yeah. I look like I'm on in a cell in like Robin Island or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like um, bleak cinder block walls. I'm going to I like start... to make my shop look like a prison. It keeps everyone uh, controlled. All my employees stay <laughs> under control. And I, I lead by fear. Yeah. There you, you go. Have a, you have a loudspeaker. It is now break time. Break time. 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I got loudspeakers, whips, whatever. I got attack dog. I got a giant attack dog. Yeah, you do. yeah, he walks around with he walks around with his Doberman <laughs> checking on everybody's work. <laughs> Big Doberman, yeah. He keeps so, him in line. To uh to start off the questions here, I've got one. Jesse, think of something that you can ask Liam in a bit, and let's keep it regards to uh to blacksmithing. Um but I have a question. Liam, have you have you ever done this? Right in the nuts. Nope. Do you, do you know who that is? It's Alec, isn't it? Yeah. It's young a Alec. Time ago. <laughs> yeah, I thought everyone had already seen that video. I've never oh seen it. Oh my god. That is <laughs> yeah, I love how he, I love how he tries to, I love how he tries to just work through it like oh and then he like lifts it like, oh, I'm going to take another swing. And he's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You just nutted yourself. Mm. Oh, man. I've so, never seen that. I, I, I was, I actually just today, I was like, I got to find something funny. And I was like, blacksmith fail. And that was the first thing that came up. And then after I watched it, I was like, I recognize that guy. Yeah. How is that not like viral in the blacksmithing world? It probably is. I, I think, think it was. We, that happened we, years ago, though. Obviously. He looks like he's 11. Which was three years ago, probably. <laughs> hey, I'm like, I think I'm only a year older than Alec. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. They're both young, young, young whippersnappers. Young guys. I'm getting pretty um, old now, though. 
How old are you now? I'm getting hardened. Uh, <laughs> 24. 24. Wow. So, guys, I got. I also got a su surprise here. I got a. I got a member from the Makers Mob who wanted to ask you a question, um, and I'm going to pull him pull him on screen with us here. It's for those watching. My name's Adam Henkel because the name tag says so. But I'm with the Makers Mob, um, and so this is just one of the things we're we're starting to do when these lives is we're pulling in members, giving them opportunity to ask some questions, kind of face to face. So, Michael Hensgen. Uh, is one of our our members, so I'm going to pull you on, Michael. So make sure you uh, make sure you're ready. Here we go. What's going on, Michael? Hey guys, how's it going? What? Pretty Howdy. good. Michael, Best shoot your question. Not today. <laughs> What's your question there, Michael? Uh, my question for uh, for Hoffman would be: If you want to start out, what considerations should I make for for ventilation? In like a small shop setting depends how long you want to live uh, <laughs> <laughs> longer than tomorrow I guess <laughs> I mean it is, it is for, for like, the, would, I think the biggest you, thing is what did you say where is the best place to begin with ventilation to kind of get started something kind of affordable but it's gonna do the trick too well, I think that the main things are evacuating the air that's in your shop and then circulating the air that's in your shop. If, uh, if there's no airflow, then you're not moving anything out. So, um, it, like I said, it, uh, I didn't say this already, but it kind of depends on your shop too. If you have like a dirt floor shop, you're not going to be able to put big fans in there. You're just going to blow the dirt up and that's going to make yeah. it worse. If you have the type of shop where you can, put fans in and ventilation in then you know i would just get a big a drum fan like a three foot diameter drum fan at the door that's blowing air out and then you could get fans at the back of your shop up up high that's that's blowing down um depending on the type of work you do if you don't want to do that then you could have uh, jet makes these air filtration units that hang from the ceiling and those just get very fine particles if you've got a ton of contaminants moving through those filters are going to get clogged too quickly but uh, you can set those up i've got uh five of them in this in the room next to me in the shop and okay. um we just keep them on but that this is in the machine room part of the shop the forging part of the shop we just use big fans fans everywhere constant airflow air movement to keep everything a little and then do you have but, like you have like a grinding room that's kind of like a separate, and you have yeah like isolated dust collection for all the yeah. metal particles because you but don't. That's do you wear respirators still, or do you have good most dust of collection? the time? Yeah, but that's not realistic for a lot of shops. If you don't have the space, then everything's going to be mixed in, and uh, the best thing you can do is wear a respirator most of the time if you're grinding, um, if you're forging. I don't get people that wear respirators when they're forging. I've seen people do it. I really don't understand that. <laughs> but um, I would say just having healthy airflow through the building would be the most simple thing for keeping your, your air healthy. It just depends on how far you want to go. I guess, what Jesse, you, you kind of have a similar situation with you have like air in and then just like two big fans blowing everything out, right? Yeah, I took out like one of my big windows that the seal was gone on it anyways. And so I built like a frame and I put in two uh, like 20 inch um, fans with like cages or whatever on them. And they they move about 2200 CFM or something like that. And then, so I can turn them on and they have, you know, two different settings, like kind of half full speed and then half speed. So I just crack a window at the far end of my shop. Um, and then I turn those fans on and keep the door closed and it creates like a crazy draft. Like you've seen in, in one of my videos where I talk about it, like if you stand in front of the window, it's just like the wind is like getting, you know, sucked in crazy fast because the fans really move. And like, I'll take a leaf blower inside my shop. Like I did in the video and like the whole shop just turns that. into this dust cloud and it's like cleared out within like two minutes. Right. So. Uh, and I try to keep that going. Like when, if I'm working, I'll keep one of those fans on and the window open so that 
you know, when I'm using the router and, it, and it's kicking up a bunch of dust, um, it'll just kind of get pulled away instead of just like hanging in, in the air as yeah. I'm just like continually breathing it in. So it kind of like Liam says, like you want to just keep the air moving out, which kind of creates like an outdoor atmosphere, but inside, right? Where the air is just kind of naturally moving, like the wind would or the breeze would kind of just take all that crap if you were just working straight outside. And so that like it's made a huge difference. Whereas like I used to, you know, like certain times of the day, like the sunlight would be coming through and you'd <laughs> see like all the dust particles in the air and i'm like oh that's what i'm breathing in that's what the inside of my lungs look like whereas like now like when the sun starts to go down and it shines through the window like the air is like all clear because i keep that fan kind of going right it's the the negative is that it sucks all the heat out of your shop in the winter time um so i don't have like a recirculator kind of unit that filters the air yeah. but keeps it inside the shop so it's it's in that sense it sucks but i'm i'm in a pretty moderate climate we don't get super cold winters anyway so it's not that big a deal but yeah you just don't want still air yeah you just want airflow there's tons of michael, ways to do it michael are is there anything you're thinking of of making you know you're saying you're a beginner you're just starting out in blacksmithing is there something in particular that you're looking at building um, I always wanted to build a knife, actually. I just was go. never sure how to incorporate woodworking, and I mean more on the more on the safety end of things. Like, how do I incorporate a woodworking shop with a little bit of a forging shop? Like, obviously, it's combustibles in a in a woodworking shop. So that's been the part that's really kept me leery of doing the two. And I don't have my shop's only a thousand square feet, so it's I can't really start dividing Sweet. things. It's like I already have enough room so because i've got a full wood shop but i would like something to do a little bit of forking so that's the part i would maybe he can shed some light on how to incorporate both safely yeah like i have a one wall in my shop where it's like that's my metal working wall and i made my benches all out of with liam and we all weld we welded them all up and and made them out of <clears throat> angle iron and sheet steel and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and so that's kind of like the wall, like when you first enter my shop and then I kind of have like a big assembly table. And then on the other side of my shop is where all my machines are with the dust collection and that sort of stuff. So it's kind of, it's not like there's no partition, like separating it and like all sorts of Karens on YouTube were just like, you're going to burn your shop down. And you yeah. know, f you know, just, ripping me apart in the comments and i'm like well i haven't burned my shop down yet you know but you know you do have to take certain precautions and like my kind of rule is if i'm doing any grinding in the shop i i stop grinding like at least a half an hour before i leave my shop or close it up for the night so, because i was working at a camp one time and i was doing a bunch of grinding in the shop at the camp and uh, I kind of was like finished and then I left and the superintendent was like checking things before he went to bed and he went into the shop and there was like a smoldering rag like right on the on the workbench where I'd been grinding. <laughs> and the next day he kind of like took me aside and he was just like, hey, like you almost burnt the whole camp down. Um, and he's like, let's not do any grinding, you know, at least an hour or half hour before you leave the shop because, you know, you have a chance of like a little spark just landing on something and it's not going to catch on fire right away. But so, so yeah, I like have that rule and then obviously just keeping things clean as clean as possible and like keep sweeping up, keep, you know, not letting like sawdust like because sawdust will land on my workbench and stuff like that and so I, okay. I always have to like blow that all off and vacuum it up before i start doing any like forging or or grinding and that sort of stuff so it, pretty common sense stuff but you know you'd be surprised how many people lack that nowadays yeah i would i would say that uh a fire is not going to start if there's nothing to start fire so you know a spark landing on a <laughs> solid board of wood is not going to catch the wood up on fire there's not enough heat from that spark but a spark falling in a pile of sawdust could catch the sawdust on fire so i just say that diligence with removing dust would be really all that's necessary to prevent a fire don't not having cluttered piles and corners if everything is organized and if your dust is removed before you start forging or grinding or whatever it is a fire is not going to appear out of anywhere. 
you just have to think how does a fire start if you remove that then there's no fire awesome uh michael thanks for joining us on here uh coming on and, and asking the question um Thank we're gonna you. we're gonna send you on your way into the the mysterious world of the interwebs uh good luck have michael a, have a good night good michael to, good to see you michael um all right, we got some questions in the chat here. Uh, Liam, this one is is for you. Have you ever made or ever make a wrapped eye axe from forty one forty? No. You would if you were making a wrapped eye axe. Uh, the wrapping part would not be in a uh, tool steel or high carbon steel or an alloy an alloyed steel. It would be a mild steel or a wrought iron. So if if you're doing a wrap around, the whole point of a wrap around is to use a small amount of high carbon steel. So um, the body, the strap that you wrap around would be 1018 mild steel or wrought iron. And then you would forge weld in the bit into the edge. Uh, it would just be, um, it'd be harder to weld if it was solid 4140. It would be harder to forge, especially if you don't have power hammers or presses, and uh, it would be more expensive. So, I've I have done wrap wrap around axes, but not not using four forty one forty. And um, what would you use? <clears throat> Ten eighteen for the wrap around part, which is mild steel, and then you could you could put forty one forty in the edge. Uh, I probably wouldn't, I'd probably put like 1095, 1085, 1075, W1, something like that in the edge of the ax. Why is that? 4140. Huh? Why is that? Why, why, why not 4140? 4140 doesn't weld as easily as those other simple carbon steels do. Oh, okay. And uh, 4140, I don't know how to so 4140 is great if you're doing a solid steel axe because it's a great compromise. You can use it as a hammer on one side. You can use it as a blade on the other and you get a rock. Well, my rock well is like 55, 56 for an axe. Um, but if I were just doing the edge, I would use something that can get even harder and then temper it down. But I can't make a solid axe out of 1095. That'd be nuts. So it, if I, if I were just using a little, little bit I'd use a different seal. Is ten ninety five really hard to work or what? Mm, or is it expensive? Not with my it'd just be way it'd be crazy expensive. And then I couldn't yeah. it, it would be labor intensive to have a hardened pole because I'd have to temper it down so much. Yeah, yeah. Um got another one here, Liam. How do you maintain the integrity of having a handmade axe while incorporating more and more equipment into your process? Do you draw the line somewhere? Where's the line, Liam? Yeah. The line is just made up. I, I love it when these people are like, you're cheating. No, I, I, I'm thinking, show me the rule book. <laughs> That's a there good is, answer, actually. Um, yeah, there. it, it is. Um, you do have to draw a line, though. I'm not, not saying I can just... I mean, I can make up whatever I want, but it, is that going to be good for my customers? Is it going to, am I going to personally like be able to sleep at night knowing that I've done something like that? And, um, my, I know where my personal line is and it is not, it's actually not difficult for me to not pass that because I get this weird icky feeling inside where there's no, it doesn't. Hmm. it would defeat the purpose of everything that I started and my products and my philosophy be behind everything. And it would just be like totally a uh, short term sellout. So, um, you know, I have, uh, there are people who, um, will, will look at me using a power hammer or a, for a hydraulic press with dies in it or dies that I designed and made by hand or whatever. And they'll call that, you know, mass production or, or factory made or whatever. And it's like, you know, I've done everything that I've done. If, 
if I wanted to be doing it like Grants vs. Brooks or like someone else, I'd be doing it right now. There's nothing yeah. holding me back other and than my choices. Would you would you consider those axes still handmade, or would you say they're in a kind of a different? They do things. I think the Grants vs. Brooks axes are handmade. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Like even though they have those giant, you know, forging yeah. presses or whatever, where it's just like kind of move from one thing to the next, and you know, allows, but it's like there's yeah. still a lot of a lot of skill that goes into like, you know, keeping that right and all the timing that goes into you know putting it putting it out. But yeah. But I don't yeah, want it. to be doing it like them. There's what's the point in me doing it the same way that they do it? Then how am I different? Yeah. And then what's the what's the difference between Grants vs. Brooks and mine? It's all just the same. If you want to stand out, then you have to obviously do something different. So yeah. uh, you know, as far as um what is handmade and what isn't handmade, that's like more philosophy than it is a rule. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. if, we can, uh, if we come to your shop in another five years and you have those like friggin' robot arms that are just like <laughs> grabbing the steel out of the forge and like putting it in the press and it's just yeah. like, well, you know, I calibrated them with my movements. <laughs> right. So technically it's still a human motion, but you know, so no, it, it's I, still I classified that's as that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, not that's, not that's where you draw the line. Robots but, in your shop is where you draw the line for sure. No robots, right? I mean, no it robots. can change. The line can budge a little bit, you know, robotic <laughs> employees. But no, the, the line is your own personal integrity. If you have a trouble keeping that line, then you've got a trouble with your own personal integrity. And it's also I like think. a – I think quality is more yeah. more like the governing body mm -hmm. where it's just like are we compromising quality – by integrating a new tool or a new system, mm -hmm. right? And it's just like obviously well, your 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 mo motive is to improve quality, you know, as well as obviously make enough axes to keep all the hungry Hoffman axe junkies out there happy, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's there's you know, am I going to be sacrificing quality by bringing in a bigger machine? And there's also, am I going to be sacrificing quality by not bringing in that machine? If you look at an axe that I make today. Uh, well, I guess depending on who looks at it, if they know what they're looking at. But um, in my opinion, an axe that I make right now is way better than an axe that I made two years ago. Way sure. better. Yeah. And That's it's because awesome. of all the processes that we've been killing ourselves designing and engineering and making. And um, I have made comments over the years many multiple times that uh, whenever this – uh, handmade, not handmade, uh, you know, topic comes up. And I, my response is always, uh, my number one goal is to make the best acts that I can make. And I'm going to do that by any means possible, as long as it doesn't sacrifice my own integrity. So, you know, if that means me buying a bigger power hammer or buying another machine or, or whatever, um, I'm going to do it. I'm not, I'm just going to well, do it. Not only that, but it's like, you also have business sense in the fact that there's a good, good amount of demand for your product. So, you know, to, to not to try and address that demand and try and meet it, it or, you know, at least bring your production up to a level where it's like, we're not compromising any quality, but we're creating twice as many or four times as many axes using these new processes, which is making twice as many customers happy. Like, you know, you would be kind of a douche to not do that. You know, like it's, you know, like the purists where it's like, you know, I love it when you do your rants um, about people that kind of rib you about those sorts of things, because it's like, it's similar where, I don't get it nearly as much because I've always been a power tool and hand tool guy, but some people are like, oh, you know, they, they, they've pulled the same thing where you're cheating or whatever because you use a router or whatever, and they're hand tool only woodworkers where I'm like, good on you, you know, like I prefer well, to be able to make a thousand pieces in my lifetime as opposed to 10 pieces. Um, because my time is also valuable to me. And so it's like, I'm going to use modern tools. Cause at the same time, I'm like, dude, if you had any great artist, any great blacksmith, 
you know, it's like if you were to bring Michelangelo into modern day and be like be using a pneumatic, he would be using a <laughs> pneumatic tool. He'd be like, "This is the shit." <laughs> going after it, angle grinders and diamond blades, right? And he'd be pumping out masterpieces like David every two months, and and so it's just like, you know, for people to be like, like, "Oh no, this week. yeah, we're just gonna." We're just going to keep the like old ha- hammer and chisel. And, you know, I really love that carpal tunnel feeling. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm going to just keep going for it. So it's, it's that sort of stuff where I'm just like, if that's your thing, well, by all means, man, if you get your Zen, you know, fix or whatever by using only hand tools, go right ahead. But I'm like, I love doing what I do. And I'm sure you you, you obviously do as well. Like geek out, geeking out on the process and trying to be efficient is Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's part of the whole thing, and it's very rewarding. Well, the too, thing is, is that the bottom line is that people are going to make their own uh, opinion of who you are, and they have no idea who I am. So I don't know where these people have got this thing. That they're saying that like I've gone back on who I am, and like I'm not <laughs> doing it the right way. And it's like you know. You have no idea who I am at all. <laughs> and I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing. And I'm fortunate enough to right now in the position to where I can. And people like that. And I think that um, with anyone who is doing something like this, you should do that. You shouldn't do what anyone else wants. Because then you're not, uh, you don't have the passion. And if you don't have the passion, you're not going to be able to put in the work that it requires to put in to make something successful. Yeah. Because uh, you you can't do what you can't do the hours that's required if you don't love it, and you're not going to yeah. love it if you're if you're pushing someone else's agenda. You're yeah, not authentic sure. with yourself. Um, you're telling yourself lies in your head about who you are based off of what other people think, which is a lie. Hey, and and at the end of the day, haters going to hate and makers going to make. It's, that's it's, right. It's just, it's just the way it is. There's a lot of haters out there. I love it because every time I run into a a, a real ornery bugger in the comment section, and I'll I'll click on their profile, just be like, oh, let's check out their channel, right? Because they're like hacking my videos and and you know like oh the audio blah blah blah. I'm like, okay, make a video. I'm like, I'm checking your profile. I don't see any. You haven't uploaded a single video to YouTube. I'm like, mm-hmm. like I get that you got problems with me, but I'm like. If you're gonna, you know, bring me some criticism, like you should at least have some skin in the game, kind of a thing. Like, so it's like, you know, judge me. Go ahead and judge me, but at least try to like walk a mile in my shoes first, and like know what it's like to try and film and build and create something nice and edit and do all the things like I did when I was starting out. And it's just like people just have no idea, right? It's like you say, like they don't, they don't know you, they don't. You know, you think Liam's, you know, sitting on the beach drinking Mai Tais, you know. <laughs> and it's like the dude. I'm in a Look behind me. Yeah. yeah. The dude I haven't lives in, in two weeks. The dude lives in a prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, well, the um, I, I, all you can do is feel sorry for them. Yeah, it's just like if they're people, hating on you, it means they have hate about themselves. And life is about evolving too. Like you know, maybe yeah. Like if you want to just be that guy that just hammers away in your dirt floor shop, and that's your thing, then go ahead. But you're never going to be able to make a successful business out of that model. It's not like it okay. might be. It might be yeah. Like if you, if your goal is to just you know check your garden and live on a, you know, a little farm somewhere and and you plug away at making tools and and selling them at local flea markets or or fairs or whatever, then it's like, go right ahead. But it's like, you can't judge a person because they were like, want to take something to the next level. It's, it just seems like a little childish, you know, but. Um, Let's get on to some other questions here. Oh, sorry. Sorry for cutting you off there. Let's get on a couple more questions here. We got, uh, Liam, someone's asking, uh, you were talking about putting out some axe handles in a year or so. Are you thinking hammer handles too? Oh, yeah. All sorts oh, of things. Oh, Every he's handle giving, imaginable. He's giving more. How about any folders? Oh, <laughs> no. Oof. Um, have, have, you, have, have you made a folder? I've never seen a Liam Hoffman folder. Well, it's just not your jam. Probably never will. Uh, 
Another question for Liam. Any tips for turning a regular axe head into a hewing axe head? That would that would be a mission because you would have to reforge you'd have to reforge it and like heat it and then retemper the whole thing and at that uh, point it's like you might as well. I mean, you can it. hew with an axe that's not offset. If you want, to, I would say your best option to turn a regular axe into a hewing axe head would be just regrind the edge to a, a chisel a, edge. A asymmetrical grind on the yeah. one side. But uh, you don't need. I wouldn't like attempt to offset the eye or do anything crazy like that i would just try to regrind it make it flat on one side and beveled on the other side to turn an old axe into a hewing axe or you, you could just hew re, with you could rehandle re it too like if if it was an issue and you wanted an offset handle you could just make yeah. an offset handle that still fits in the standard eye yeah i mean you can um, make whatever you got work and for those of you who are who are in love with the romanticism of hewing, and I know there's a lot of people out there, <laughs> yeah, just just take a regular axe that you have and and hew with it, and you'll you'll quickly learn that you would probably rather use a sawmill. <laughs> it's like it's it's like all day to like square up like a couple sides of a log with it with an axe kind of a thing. So if you, if you're doing that for like exercise and stuff like that, or or you just enjoy the pure form of, of that kind of work then go ahead but it, so many people kind of geek out on this sort of stuff and then they actually go get a hewing axe and try hewing a log and they're like okay that took forever <laughs> and yeah I that is back breaking can't, can't walk the next day <laughs> because you're like hunched over the log trying to chip away <laughs> but um if you guys uh for those who are watching us here um if you guys have any more questions put them in the chat now if i didn't uh, see them and we missed it, throw them in there again. Uh, we'll have time for maybe one or two more before we wrap this thing up. But before we do that, I wanted to mention again, uh, if you're interested in learning how to build uh, the this beautiful ax here, Liam has full tutorials inside the Makers Mob. Uh, if you're a member of the Makers Mob, you get access to, to that. So you can click the link in the description. Uh, there's a deal for you on that. And then like we had mentioned before, uh, we also have the Kamiko Challenge that's coming up with uh, Pask Makes with Neil Paskin, um, which registration is closing June 13th at midnight. And uh, if you're a member of the Makers Mob as well, you get access to that. So um, just wanted to remind you of that. Click the link in the description to sign up for that if you want to. Uh, we're gonna get to last little bit I, of questions. I will, I will say, having taken a ax making course with Liam, uh, a couple years ago it's a process no doubt about it it's 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 a it's a process and it requires you know like making some tools and you know having a basic kind of setup but once you actually have uh the drifts and you know an anvil and a forge or even access to it it's like the process of making the axe i was quite surprised at how kind of straightforward and and like fun it was like it you know we you, we made the axe heads like you know in a couple hours kind of a thing like that one day and i was thinking like you know how the heck are we punching you know holes through this thick of, of steel and it was like well it actually went really quickly you know especially having like liam show you like okay well you start with this one and then you move to a bigger one and and it was kind of like, and then you work as a team and we add other people. And it was just like, it was a really cool process. And, and overall, like the labor involved in making the axe once you have the tools was not like mind boggling. Like I thought it might be like, I thought like this is going to take way more than a couple of days, but you know, it was kind of like these, you work really hard for a couple of hours. Right. And then a lot of the time consuming part is more like the heat treating and, you know, waiting, you know, doing the whole tempering process and keeping it in the oven and that sort of stuff. So, you know, as far as actual labor and investment and time into making an awesome tool, it wasn't, it wasn't that much, you know, like we, we, we basically made the axes in one day and then kind of like finished them out and did the handles the next day. And I was just like, dude, that was awesome. Like to be able to make an ax in a weekend and have a lot of like fun time as well, hanging out with the people that we were working with. It, it was, it was sweet. So, you know, don't, don't see making an ax as like this overwhelming project. It's actually not that, that difficult once you get into it. 
Yeah, it's super easy, everyone. Um, super Jesse, easy. this is a question for you. As an accomplished woodworker, why does your axe not already oh, have a new samurai handle? I was gonna, I was mm. gonna make my own handle, and I was like, oh, it's an opportunity. I could rehandle this axe head, but you know, Liam kind of offered on Instagram, and so I was like, well, I didn't want to like kind of be like, screw your handles, you know, I'll make my own. Mm. Um, I'm glad you, know, you didn't hurt my feelings I, like that, Jesse. I was just, I was just trying to be courteous and like allow him the opportunity to, you know, send a replacement. <laughs> I failed. <laughs> I failed on the opportunity. <laughs> um, Liam, do you need certain tools for your class, like an axe, eye, drift? Actually, you teach them. There's other tutorials where Liam teaches you how to make the tools necessary, right? You do a, you did a shear. Tutorial, you did. Uh, what else did you do? You did a I punch. did a type of a punch. I did a hot cutting shear, and the axe. Is there yeah. another one? Uh, there's another one. I can't remember what it is. It's a surprise tutorial. Oh, the chain. The no, the other one. Oh, well, that was, was the, the flail. flail. The flail. That's right. <laughs> okay. Some the, the, the <laughs> death flail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, for those of you into making to make a death flail, medieval weaponry. <laughs> Yeah. I still haven't seen anyone uh, post a picture in our group about them making that flail. But, it, but one to day. answer this guy's question, uh, yes, you need lots of tools to make an axe. Um, you definitely need a drift, at least a couple drifts to make an axe. Um, you need uh, folders and set hammers and um, hot cuts and uh flatters those types of tools all help um do you recommend on... like making them all yourself or is or because i there are a lot of blacksmiths out there that like sell tongs and sell all the the mm -hmm. hardy tools and like cut it and that sort of stuff and i've i've kind of been like oh like for my next project like i should just start making all these tools which is obviously a good learning experience but if you want to like get to right onto the making you know, axes, it's like you can, you know, support other blacksmiths that make the tongs and they're re pretty reasonably priced. A lot of, a lot of people that sell tongs and, and like basic hammers and, and fullers and that sort of stuff. And you can just, you know, spend a couple hundred bucks and buy the tools and then it get depends. right to axe making. It depends on where you are in your making, your making journey. Um, <laughs> if you are, in business like i am then i'm gonna buy the tools to make what i need to unless i can't buy the tools like drifts and um of course all of the dies that we have are totally uh invented by us and made by us custom the, the drifts especially are incredibly crucial to be able to make them the axes and the speed that we need to but like tongs Screw tongs. I'm gonna buy tongs. I'm not gonna make my own tongs. Yeah. But if you're if you started blacksmithing six years or six months ago or a year ago or two years ago or whatever, uh, then I would absolutely recommend trying to make your own tools. But if you're um if you're further along, uh, you're not gonna gain any experience from it unless you just enjoy making them, then make them. But uh you made the drifts that we used at the at the workshop because yeah. the, you had tried to mail them and they didn't arrive, and so we we're like, you were like, screw it, we're gonna make our own drifts. And yeah. You guys pounded out a I couple of drifts that. in like a few hours. I remember. Yeah, and, um, it's there's so many. Uh, it depends on what your goal is. Like, if you're, it's easy to make one axe, make a hundred of the same axe, and do it profitably is a whole other ball game. Yeah. And um, it, it just is which mindset are you thinking of? If I want to make one axe, then I don't need many tools. I, I'm not concerned about how long it takes. If I want to make 50 axes in that day, everything has to run smoothly like clockwork where you will not get it done physically, mentally, <clears throat> or just with your time limit. The drifts have to be perfect. The tooling has to be perfect. Um, if you have a snag, you'll never make, meet your goal, but that's a totally different. I don't want to, some of the things I'm saying, I don't want people to take is like, oh, well, I have to have all this stuff or it has to be just right to do this. No, I'm talking about making 
a lot of axes. Yeah. If you make want to make one axe, uh, it's not that crucial. It's not that critical. Um, you'll learn just by doing it. You, it, it's just going to take a lot of ex, um, doing, trying. But uh, no, I'm not trying to intimidate anyone with with what you need to try to start out. Uh, Chris Young asks, quick question. I have a Husqvarna Forester axe. You need to buy an LH axe. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't keep the it sharp. only suggestion. You can't keep it sharp. That's all I got to say. Why? <laughs> um, have, have you owned the axe from new? Because like a lot of times old people, like if you get an axe that's like used, some people, I remember people, I saw people when they broke their axe handle, they threw their axe head in the fire to burn, mm. to burn <laughs> out, to burn out the wood. And they're like, oh, it's the easiest way to get the, the remaining parts of wood. And I was like, are you crazy? Like, you just totally softened your whole axe head now and it's not going to hold an edge. Right. So, so yeah, there's some people that don't understand, you know, the process of taking care of a steel tool that, you know, is made to hold an edge and a lot of people screw stuff up that way. So that, or it's just a cheap axe, but husk, I don't know. I don't have any Husqvarna axes, so I can't. I mean, there's so many things that we don't know about your situation with sharpening uh, a lot of sharpening is geometry, not just what grit you took it up to. Uh, you say that axe is six years old in your comments here. I'm reading, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk about chef's knives for a second. The They have to be extremely thin to cut vegetables. It doesn't matter if it's sharpened at 2000 grit and you can see yourself in the edge. It's, the, it's not thin. It's not going to cut. And uh, the proper way to sharpen uh, most knives, especially chef's knives, is to not just sharpen the actual teeny tiny edge, but to sharpen the entire flat bevel of the knife, which is gonna ruin the finish, it's gonna make it ugly. But if you don't do that every time you sharpen, then you're bringing the edge of that up the spine and a knife is a wedge, wedge. So the higher up you get, the thicker, behind the edge becomes and your knife becomes useless so uh, that might be what's happening with your axe is your geometry is not right maybe you have it sharp but uh, it's not going to cut if the geometry is not right you might have to come back further in the head and thin it down um, or you or you thinned it too much and it's too fine of an edge and it's dulling because yeah, you, you have that's too, too fine of an edge usually not the case with with that usually people will just start making it my gosh, this camera's opposite. You <laughs> usually start making it just uh, more and more obtuse of an angle, and the axe isn't going to cut. Um, we're going to do two more questions. Here's here's one for you. Oh, sorry, Jesse. This is in a com. This is a comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think I don't think Liam has seen it. You would probably joke. you would appreciate it, Liam. You should. Did see, you see you my ninja video from like two days ago? No, you should click Adams though, because he he basically just makes fun of me. The whole video is like a spoof of. I made fun of, of the old video. samurai. It was old samurai, and and it's it's good. It's good for a laugh for sure. You you used to be uh, quite a bit more. You put on the arrogant persona a little bit more. Yeah. You turned it up back in the day. So well, you know, yeah, you, you got to make a splash when you come onto the YouTube scene, right? So you gotta, you gotta be that dancing monkey, and uh, I've, I've tried to tone it down, but you know. Uh, Eric says hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. So okay. we're, we're late. sorry too, Eric. <laughs> uh, the last one. Let's pull up. Sorry if I miss you guys' questions. Um, let's just talk. Hey, Jason Hoffman. Is that your cousin? Hey, Jason. Good cousin of mine. No. Uh, uh, is it is hard, it to, hard put to put together, together a forge and does it cost much? No, I, tip, I, I got tip. my my forge is, was off of eBay like 15 years ago and it was about $300 and it just shipped yeah, and right he scammed to me. me to make a table for it, a forge stand for it, or, yeah, or for his anvil. So, yeah, that was a be it's a beautiful piece. I, I, I still look at it and admire it. So, yeah, no, like you can get for you can spend you know a couple grand on a forge or you can spend four or 500 bucks and get like some guy that makes some out of old propane tanks in his backyard. They'll, they'll still work as long as they got a decent burner and, and you put some fuel in it. Um, yeah. But yeah. 
Oh, there's, the last there's so many different ways to make forges. Uh, there's induction forges, propane forges, oil forges, charcoal forges, coal forges. Uh, when I first started, I used a uh, just wood charcoal and uh, put cinder blocks around the fire with holes in the sides and use an air dryer and just kept feeding it wood and it will get really hot and that costs you like nothing. And uh, if you want to upgrade from that, you go to coal and you, you really don't need anything other than a uh, something to contain the fire, keep it condensed and then an air source and then your nice. fuel coal charcoal. So now it's really cheap. Um, and Liam um, has a book as well that shows oh, you yeah. how to like do blacksmithing on the cheap, <laughs> or, you know, starting out and making your own tools. So yep, I give book. you, I tell you how to do it from nothing. Uh, this is a question for you, Liam. On on, I believe it's to do with purchasing one of your axes. For my axes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the secret? What's the secret? He's He's the secret. right now. You have to create your own algorithm that is just ready to buy the second it goes, and eventually the algorithm will just time it perfectly. And, you need to hire it. like a computer engineer, first or, of all, or outs outsource, you know, to uh, people in India and just have hire a hundred, a hundred little kids in a foreign country. Yeah, and, and they on the computer clicking. No, the the secret is there. Own, there is no secret. Right? It's like it's like eBay back in the day where you had to like get in there before like the auction like ended and like put your bid in at like the last second kind of thing. And it's like it's 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 muscle memory. It's a skill. It's like it's like forging an axe. Buying an There's axe three. on Liam's website is is also a, a skill set unto itself. <laughs> some some people seem to have mastered it because they're always snagging axes, and then other people yeah. are just getting stumped. I, and, I saw a post the other day where someone was going to sell their intellectual property on their tricks for getting an axe oh. off their website, so you could take them up on that. That's some uh, entrepreneurialism. <laughs> there's a, there's, a, yeah, there's, I've, yeah, people are making great businesses off of mine right now, but there's, there's multiple ways to order one. You can get in on the website drops, which is every Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and there's 10 available, and it's only the one model, and you have to beat everyone to the checkout. That's usually five seconds. Liam's axes, Liam's axes and acquiring one of his axes is similar to like Bitcoin. There's only so much of it. Nobody has knows how to actually get the stuff. And it's just one of these things that it's like the more you just dive into that world, then eventually you'll you'll get the skills. But you can't just be yeah. like, oh, I think I'm going to pick up a Liam Hoffman axe today. It's like, no, you got you to gotta invest some time and learn the skills, talk to the right people. And uh, eventually, eventually it'll happen for you. I'm just, I'm glad that I just personally know Liam. And so I can just message him and be like, hey, can you just not true? Because apparently you asked extra for act. a handle. You <laughs> asked for a handle and I never even sent it to you. I so didn't want to bother you, but you did send me the axe with a handle, the original yeah. handle. Well, I'm glad know. that it came with a handle because that'd be, that'd be weird if it didn't. Yeah. So. You see that, Liam? Yeah. What? That you don't make malls. Me. I don't know have what. You it, ever, have what you ever? Have you ever made a mall? Name was no. It's it wasn't a mall. He probably just doesn't have the correct name for it. Probably yeah. the far the farm axe. That gigantic mother. Yeah. Axes on the secondary go for two, three plus times retail. That's why I said it's like Bitcoin. The value is just going up. Like you, you never know. And I don't think even Elon Musk could get Liam Hoffman axes to go down in value. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like he could probably figure it figure out. Figure it out. Okay, this is the last question we're going to take. Uh, let's get your take on that, and then we'll we'll wrap this thing up. Can I leave my anvil out in the weather, or will it ruin it? Um, kind of hard it's to not ruin really going to ruin it. I Make mean, it rusty. It's, you could, you, yeah, it'd get rusty. If you use it frequently, then it, it probably won't be getting very rusty. At least not the face of the anvil. You could put oil on the, on the outside of it. But no, it's not going to destroy the anvil, really. That's just steel. 
It's just metal. And and if you keep enough oil on it, like a lot of people, well, back in the day, blacksmith shops were all kind of out in the open air. And so it's like the, the steel's going to oxidize. But I guess as long as you keep enough oil on it, it's not going to have any. Yeah, I, I was set up in a shack that snow blew into in the winter <laughs> for uh, <laughs> like eight years. And in the, in the spring, especially, we'd have like 40 degree temperature changes in a single day. And whenever that would happen, everything that was metal in the shop would be covered with water condensation and uh, everything would rust. And then in a few days you know, from using everything or I just wipe it off real quick, it's fine. And um, I did that for a long time. so. No, it's not going to ruin anything. Just more maintenance. Yeah. Well, thanks, yeah. guys, for uh, for joining me. We should do this again sometime. That was fun. Next yeah, time, was let's, fun. Let's, let's have like a happy hour, you know, <laughs> have a couple beers. Missed couple opportunity. Beers. Yeah. Uh, well, Liam, okay. I was going to say, too, that we're going to be filming a Maker's Mob thing this Sunday. Oh, Ooh. sweet. What are you filming? For the first time in two years. Is this, um, it's a secret? Uh, gonna, no, gonna, I just okay. haven't uh, haven't told anyone. Nice. Maybe that's a, maybe that means it's a secret. Um, I don't know what I might make uh, a integral punch dagger or something. Oh, cool. cool. I just know that my my buddy's coming over Sunday and we're gonna film something for Maker's Mom. Sweet. Nice. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, if you guys want to get in on Maker's Mob, we got the Kamiko Challenge, like we said earlier. We have the full tutorials for Liam's axes and some other stuff in there you can get. Click the link in the description. Thank you guys for uh, for joining me on here, and we'll let you guys get back to your lives. Good to see you, man. I, I look forward to uh, receiving the handle uh, in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a con artist. <laughs> <laughs> We're into this. If, if, you're right. too, if you're too busy, I can make my own handle. But uh, you know, okay, it's, it's yeah, up to you. guilt trip me. Thanks <laughs> for joining us, guys. Okay. Uh, Wood Ninja out. Wood Ninja. Right. Out. See you later, you guys. See you, Adam. <laughs>